so I would like to thank you all the uh, participants, all the guests that, that, that registered for our uh, info share today. Uh, we will be presenting, it's a follow up of the discussion and the meeting that we had on the 13th of October uh, on Wednesday, uh, where we discussed the um, quantum key distribution simulators and some results from the simulation. And today we will follow the discussion uh, and focus on the physical implementation and the test books that were established and are already working and what are the first challenges and ideas that we need to face. Uh, my name is Piotr Bihovsky, I'm from PSNC. Um, uh, I will be chairing the, uh, the meeting and the sessions today. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Xavier was not able to join us today and together with our uh, WP6 uh, task, we will uh, share the discussion. Uh, so uh, just a short reminder uh, of our uh, introduction. So as Tim mentioned, we will be recording the session today uh, to allow uh, for further uh, view and the discussion. And it will be, uh, it is uh, recorded and organized under the WP6, uh, general WP6 activities. Uh, so as we already mentioned on Wednesday, um, our activities are focused to make more quantum aware our community. And first of all, focus on the dissemination activities. So organize info sharing workshops and Publish documents. We already uh, have some documents. You can find it on the uh, white white paper that can be found on the Jean Mistress's webpage. Of also, we do update the wiki page, where you can we, we can find the news and some information that we publish regarding the advancement and our activities. Uh, and we also focus on the testing with the other projects and and, and partners. And of course, we discuss the possible quantum technology solution that can be used and what are the standardization challenges that need to be discussed. Um, so our team is, uh, is presented here. As you can see, we have a, a small, small, at the moment we have a small group uh, from, from our Emirates of Jant. So um, please free. Uh, to ask and send our questions, or you can in, uh, you can register for our list. Please free to do it, and uh, you can participate in our meetings. Uh, so you can uh, you can ask the questions through the Zoom chat. Please free to uh, uh, do not hesitate to ask, and then at the end of the uh, sessions in the Q and A part, we will try to answer the the questions. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, it is a continuation of the forum for info share that we did on Wednesday. Uh, so uh, we will focus here on the implementation and the test bits that are already in the, uh, in the uh, NREN's infrastructure and what infrastructure is actually used. And you will be, um, you can also go back and see our previous info shares. These are published on the Jant TV channel. And as I mentioned, the white paper. Uh, so regarding the agenda, um, uh, the first presentation that we like to show today will be regarding the quantum key distribution link that was implemented between Ostrava and Czech Republic and Czechian in Poland. So it will be presented by our colleague Josef from Chestnut and, and myself. And next, uh, uh, Rudolf, apologies for the, for the mistake in the, in the name. Uh, Rudolf will present the uh, testbed, uh, quantum technologies testbed data is established in the, uh, our, at our colleagues um, in Chestnut premises. And uh, then we will forward to the Q&A session uh, at 2.55, we'll take a short break. And after, uh, after discussion, after the break, we will um, present a show, show, we will present a demonstration of the 
proof of concept regarding twin field QAD that is being planned uh, uh, between Open QKD and uh, Jant and Toshiba. It was prepared by our colleague Dominico from Jant, but Unfortunately, he still cannot join today, so I will present this uh, this material. Uh, then we will have a presentation for our distinguished guest, Professor Andrzej Serep, from regarding the QCI. And at the end, I will present the test bets that we have regarding the quantum technologies here at KCC and follow the Q and A session. Uh, so this is the. Um, uh, so this is the, uh, the plan for the day. Um, and I think we can start with a presentation from Josef and, and I will also join this presentation for, for the slides to explain the PSNC part. Uh, so let me kindly uh, welcome Josef, which is uh, head of department and responsible for the network, uh, optical networks at uh, Cessnet and he's an expert in the optical transmission techniques and also he's working on the uh, quantum technology. So, uh, Josef, if it's fine, I will start stuff to share and please feel free to share your presentation. Okay, Piotr, thank you very much for a very kind introduction. So I hope that you see the slides. So I'll try to start from the beginning. Do you see a slides? Yes, yes, thank oh. you. Oh, great, great. Because this, uh, um, this QKD line, uh, if I'm not wrong, it was really first uh, cross-border uh, trial between or within uh, National Research and Education Network and community, I hope. So we really glad that we have a chance to to take a part into this uh, into this uh, trial so Piotr, you set everything so at, i think that first i'll show some necessary preparations at optical side then Piotr will continue with uh, that uh, very complicated things like the management encryptors and so on and i would like to finish with last slides what's uh, what's next what's uh, let's say not the, but slightly loosely binded to the trial. So let's go. Yeah, I already mentioned that uh, there have there have been necessary some preparations. So on uh, DWD and system on that line, the uh, our necessities and uh, what's the I think even really most important are lessons learned. Yeah, because this is at least for us. Uh, this is not what we are doing every day. So the, this line is very close to the maximal performance of the, uh, of the, of the set of devices of the Bob and Alice. Yeah? I think their specification is, sorry, sorry, think something nasty. Their specification is like 80 kilometers and uh, the system is think, a secret QKD channel directly within 1550 nanometer within C, C band. Uh, and because we were operating really, really close to the maximum performance of the device, it uh, mm, was necessary to, because the original specification of device is to use one QKD channel, one bi-directional service channel and the IP connectivity. So on such kind, such type of line, it will probably require uh, five fibers where the uh, fiber provider had really problems to provide uh, additional fibers just for the, just for the uh, duration of the trial. So the, at first uh, it was necessary to move all that IP traffic into, and also the service channel, which is fortunately, I think one gigabit um, Ethernet on off King channel. It, it, so it wasn't so complicated to move all, all the stuff into one dedicated fiber and uh, let uh, QKD channel use the, use the dedicated fiber. And Piotr, now it's on you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, Josef. So, um, so as uh, as Josef mentioned, so the system which we implemented is a complete system. So, so it has the QTD blades, QTD system, and the encryptor, which is using the keys and and, we, and is encrypting the the actual user traffic. Um, so, because there are distance limitations, as as uh, Josef mentioned. Uh, we established the QTD link only between uh, two nodes, so it's point-to-point -point connection. But the services and the user traffic, which will be used for the further use cases, analysis, and all the uh, elements that are connected with that, is being is being uh, sent over WDM system in PSNC network from Cheshire to our data center in Poznan. So we use two independent uh, 10G channels, one for the encrypted and one for the unencrypted traffic. And also in Poznan, we run the server, which is, uh, which is responsible for the QPD and encryptor management. So we have a um, uh, live monitoring of the performance, and we can we can uh, configure the system. And also, uh, at here in Poznan, we will run the services which will actually send the user traffic around to our colleagues in in, uh, in uh, Ostrava. And because it is a part of the OpenQKD project, so the link which was established is constantly from. Uh, from more or less one month is constantly monitored and visible in the virtual test that system that was established under OpenQTD, which shows um, all the elements and the uh, and the traffic in the all OpenQTD test bits in the world. I think we can advance your one slide and perfect. Thank you. Uh, so here we can see. Sorry. Uh, so here, as I mentioned, it's a just a splash screen of the, uh, the management system for the ID quantity devices that we have. On the bottom, there is just a, a view from the virtual testbed, open QTD virtual testbed. You can simply click and see all the use cases and the testbeds in Europe under the project, and you can see the performance. Of course, not all the data is available. Only the the essential that is can be can be shared with the users. So, the key uh, key rate, the quantum bit error rate, and and the uh, operational mode of the loop. And as I mentioned, from the Cheshire to Poznan, we do use the PSNC WDM system to forward and send the traffic, either encrypted and unencrypted because uh, if you would like to have full QKD link between Poznan and Ostrava, it would require a lot of separate QKD links with trusted nodes, so uh, it's physically not possible. Thank you, thank you, Josef, you can follow the discussion. Okay, so, and I think this is a really valuable, valuable things. So the um, installation performed by PSNC, uh, what we note that uh, it was uh, necessary to work very, very carefully to do the um, cleaning using microscopes, especially uh, to use uh, optical time domain reflectometers to uh, check if the uh, what we see at the end of line is what we really expect because that fiber was vacated for some time so and also to also to check if there is not something uh, sending uh, power to the fiber because there is chance that the uh, single photon detectors might be um, corrupted or or burnt, uh, and uh, what's even funny, if you are establishing this line over a large uh, distance, that uh, simply even with the state of art power meters, uh, which is, for example, uh, uh, can measure powers down to minus 90, 90, 90 dBm, it's like one nanowatt, so you still see nothing. 
So even for this work to have some single photon detectors, it can be advantage. And uh, mm, I think that these numbers, it was possible to uh, get uh, that the QBAR, it's a quantum bit error rate was achieved uh, uh, something slightly over 2%, which is good because I think that uh, this uh, Con coherent one-way protocol is secure for QB QBAR below, and I hope I remember correctly, like 11, 11%. So definitely there is still some margin in QBAR and uh, the system performs very well and it, it allow to transfer about two kilobit, two kilobit of uh, key bits over this quite long by long distance. On the on the right of the slide, you can you can see some some screenshots from the doing the, all the work. What what was necessary? And uh, yeah, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, yeah, this is uh, open QKD trial, but it was very very useful for all the participants. In all the participants, uh, including uh, Cessnet, because Cessnet with uh, partners is running uh, some national project, Network Cybersecurity in post-quantum era. This is led by the partners from Technical University Brno and also Technical University Ostrava is taking part. This is uh, the third partner of this trial. And um, the practical applicability of the QKD over lines, uh, but not the dedicated only, but over shared lines, and uh, obviously some post-quantum cryptography techniques and other things. These are the these are the major these are the major outcome expected outcomes of this project. And uh, now there is uh, the there is the. Uh, um, task running which should define the all possible uh, testing scenarios which we you can see on the right figure some some screenshot from our, our lab which uh, so this was extremely helpful to to define these scenarios very well you can see that in the lab it's slightly even low lower layer oriented it's not the complete device it's uh, single photon detectors and single photo source alone but more will be in rule of presentation so Piotr thank you very much and are there very any questions please yes uh, thank you thank you Joseph for the presentation exactly as Joseph mentioned the challenge is that uh, it is a single photon transmission so uh, there is no easy way to measure uh, you need a special way to measure the detection rate of the uh, photons. And of course, we cannot also measure in a usual way the spectrum of the photons. So it requires a special setup in, in the lab to measure the spectrum of single photons emitted by the, by the source. Uh, yes, we have a question. Uh, how long is the optical fiber reel from the lab? Joseph uh, already mentioned. Yeah, yeah, it's one spool. So typically, this spool accommodates 50 kilometer. This is a pretty standard 652 or 657 fiber. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so I'm stopping sharing. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Joseph, again for the presentation. And I think we can move to our. Uh, next uh, speaker, kindly Rudolf will present the uh, Cessnet uh, testbed. Rudolf is also our colleague at Cessnet. He's an expert in the optical, in the computer networks, optical networks, and uh, also is investigated the quantum communication aspects and the PPD technology. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. We can see the presentation, Rudolf. So. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So a little bit, a little bit. Not uh, maybe it's a little bit. Uh, could be a little bit higher, but a little bit higher. What about now? Yeah, it's better right now. Yeah. It's better. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
So, hello everybody. My name is Rudolf Ohnout. I'm from the same department as uh, Josef, and I have a, a short presentation about our um, quantum sensing testbed. So, it's it will be about uh, single photon detection, uh, and uh, I will show you the setup. And at the end, uh, I wanted to show you some so showcase, but it will be quite limited because we are facing some uh, software issues. So. Can you see now the full screen? Can you see the full screen? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I will tell you something about the motivation, uh, why we are doing it, and uh, what is it, uh, what is the, the focus of, uh, of the testbed. Uh, then, uh, what is the setup consisting of? Uh, and some of the to some of the pictures of the lab, and then uh, the remote access and uh, how, how is it working. So uh, basically, it's a, it's a basic quantum sensing um, uh, test bed or to the test site uh, in house. Uh, there uh, you have uh, some pictures uh, of uh, uh, entering our lab. Uh, so the basic purpose was to un understand the fundamentals how uh, the quantum sensing works and to get in common with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, low signals uh, and how to accommodate them or how they are interacting to together with uh, normal uh, classical transfers with the strong signals um, and of course to get the, the expertise required especially for uh, for the project that Josef was briefly mentioning uh, our national project it, it's five years long and also of course this uh, this testbed is a part of the testnet optical lab now we have uh, two um, big uh, optical labs uh, and uh, of course uh, one of the main challenges of uh, the qkd is um, the integration to uh, single fiber together with uh, other uh, data channels but um, because the nature of the QKD, that means uh, the weak signals, uh, in order to be combined on the same link with, with the classical strong signals, of course, the Raman photons will be um, always somehow interacting with, uh, with the quantum channel, which is, of course, unwanted situation. Um, so um, the, the basic use case that we have is to play with the polarization of the photons uh, and to detect uh, different uh, polarizations with different um, single photon avalanche uh, diet with the detectors. And of course, then uh, a verification of various components because now on the market, there are uh, so many vendors that are producing a lot of devices, but um, not all of them are, let's say, meet the quality standards uh, as they should. So uh, the setup is consisting of the uh, Toptica um, laser source. So it's the model DLC Pro. Uh, the main advantage is that it can be um, almost entirely um, remotely um, controlled from the PC. And I will show that later on. Uh, then we have the, the polarization controller from the, from the Phoenix Photonics. This is one of the component that uh, we have uh, really significant issues uh, working with it remotely. Uh, locally, it's, it's not a problem. Uh, then we have uh, two types of uh, single photon detectors. So we have uh, micro photon devices, uh, the model uh, PMD ER, we have uh, two of them. You can see them on uh, the picture on the right. And then uh, we have the uh, IDQ, uh, Stirling, which is the model uh, ID uh, 230. It's the black box uh, on, the, on the left side, on the top. Uh, and of course, uh, both of the devices can be connected to, uh, to counters. So we have a Stanford, Stanford's uh, SR620. Um, uh, we have a few of them. Some of them are working really good. Some of them have some issues, but because it's quite old hardware, but uh, it is one of the most reliable that you can get. And of course, then there are the 
uh, less interesting parts. Uh, there are itinerators if you don't want to uh, put their uh, uh, spool. And of course, we have the beam splitters uh, and others. Um, here is the um, setup of the test bed. So uh, we have the optical laser as the laser source. Uh, it is producing um, a laser source on 780 uh, nanometers. Uh, then uh, we have their uh, attenuators. It is connected in the uh, entanglement uh, photon source. Uh, and uh, uh, the entanglement photon source is then uh, going to uh, the polarization controller where we can I think control the polarization in, in three domains. Uh, and there is a quarter and a half uh, wave plate or board. And um, then it is continuing to polarization beam splitter where we are detecting where we can put uh, on both sides the, uh, the micro photon devices or uh, as shown here, we can uh, detect on one part uh, uh, the MPD or the other part we can detect with the, with the IDT product. And of course, you can connect them, as I already mentioned, you can connect them to universal uh, time interval counters from, from the Stanford systems. Uh, and here you can see that uh, there is a computer, so everything can be connected to the computer. Uh, but biggest problems we are issuing now is not the hardware itself, but the software support of some of the vendors and uh, the issue to even run the control applications of the hardware. So, for example, with the IDQ, which is like one of the leading companies, uh, they, uh, they don't have any official support on the website, for example, download the software and everything. Maybe they have for, for uh, registered customers, I don't know. So uh, everything that uh, is coming is coming with the hardware is the one USB drive that uh, you need to, to share this this drive uh, uh, in the, by the computers where you want to use it. Uh, and other uh, other vendors are doing the same. One exception is the uh, MPD, which has a really nice uh, software controlling controlling software that you can download from the internet. So. So and and here the main uh, the, the our main challenge is to play remotely with the or, or locally with the polarization controller, and then uh, to see uh, how the counters are uh, how, how the counting values are changing significantly when you uh, when you um, like control the the, the photons and, and polarization, and of course the entanglement. Um, Entanglement photon source from from Waterloo. Uh, you can uh, it can produce entangled photon source, or it can pr produce uh, single photons. It depends on the uh, on the on the ring and on the position uh, of the ring there. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, here are some some pictures. Uh, of course, as you all know, the one of the most uh, unwanted um properties of the single photon detection are the dark counts so uh, you the, the best thing or lessons learned from 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 playing with the setup is that you should use a very good components yeah, ideally the components uh, the optical fibers with the with the blackout cladding and uh, of course the, the connectors must be a very good quality which are not allowing uh, any any photons from the environment to go in. If you don't have uh, such um, such um, components, uh, the best or the easiest way you can do is to put uh, aluminum foil uh, on top of it, and you can reduce uh, the dark counts really significantly. So you can see on the counters that uh, that, that the unwanted uh, photon detections are really low. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, all the photon detectors, as will be shown later on, are working only with uh, 20 or maximum, for example, IDT 25% of the efficiency. 
but it is enough to to detect many of the, of the photons that are that's supposed not to be there. Yeah, and you can see all the on the right. You can see the setup uh, in action. Um, yeah, yeah, and here is just uh, a few information about the project that we have. But uh, we have also already mentioning it, so I'll, I will probably skip this one. What is I think the most interesting uh, in this is to uh, is the creation of the of the custom uh, FPGA based hardware for the for the key uh, reading and uh, the encryption of the traffic uh, based on uh, coming from for, from the network. So the FPG hardware will be like, let's say, work as a, as a cryptographic cards on, on the normal traditional uh, optical transmission systems, transmission system. Um, yeah, and now I will try to uh, show you the last one. Yeah, I will try, try to show you uh, what I have here. So, <clears throat> so basically, uh, what we have here is is a, is a computer uh, where uh, you can control the um the laser at first the laser source from so this is the the dlc pro control software uh what is really nice that it is except the emission itself so you, so uh you cannot activate the emission itself or deactivate it from the software you can set all the parameters that you can uh set uh, uh in the lab directly so you can play here with the current you can control the temperature, the stabilization, the, the, the target temperature. You can apply with the piezo control with the voltage, which you can then see here uh, in, uh, in the graph. Uh, and of course, then uh, you can use some, some white scan and also you can, uh, you can, you, you, so you can do white, uh, white scan for the current or for the voltage. And of course, uh, uh, it is, and, and here also you can use uh, external stabilization of the laser. So uh, it is allowing you to set up a fine and, and uh, fast uh, predefined values. Uh, and uh, it is, uh, it is uh, influencing the, the detected photons uh, at the end. So uh, we are still experimenting with this. We are still experimenting and trying to find uh, the best values for the setup in order to be working. You see that, for example, the temperature control is, uh, is uh, um, going really well. And uh, uh, of course, it takes some, some time to stabilize on the, on the predefined pre value. Uh, on the other side, here is the, minimize it. So here is the control software for the IDQ uh, 220. Uh, what is, and here are the issues are coming because uh, what you can see here when you connect the detector, uh, you can set the efficiency, so maximum up to 25%. And then you can set uh, the maximum, the, the, the lowest temperature uh, you can get. Uh, the um, the IDQ uh, 230 is so uh, it's should be going should be going up to minus uh, 19 uh, of Celsius, but the, the biggest problem here is that it takes a lot of time to stabilize on this temperature. So, uh, for example, we were not able to stabilize uh, long term stability to to achieve the long term stabilization on the best uh, settings that you can get. That means the efficiency 25% and minus 90 degrees. Uh, the system was not, wasn't stabilized even after a week from uh, when we turn it on. And here you can see that uh, I predefined, especially for today, uh, the efficiency on the 20% and the stabilization temperature for 70. Uh, 
and it is uh, and uh, the the target temperature of the detector is still fluctuating. And uh, in order to be able to detect the photons, it must be stabilized. So in in, in long term, so uh, here, which can be which can be shown which will be shown here not by the, by the red lines but uh, by the by the white line. Uh, and so for for this, it is even though it's it is like showing you that everything is green and everything is ready. The system is not uh, not detecting any photons unless it is stabilized. And now you can see that this destabilized really a lot. So it is stabilization it is stabilized when it, when there are no fluctuates at all in this pair. So maybe after a few days more it will be okay, but it's not. And uh, here we have uh, just for demonstration we have uh, another we have the PDM software, but the PDM software from from some reasons or uh, or is uh, is crashing, uh, and we are still investigating why this is happening. So I just wanted to show you that uh, by by this that it is not easy to uh, to manage this, but not uh, because of of the hardware. But in this case, it seems that it's a hardware problem as well. But uh, mainly with the software, which is quite simple, uh, and except the the, the topica. Uh, it is not allowing you to to sell much. Uh, yeah, so that's I think everything from my side. And if you have any questions, uh, you can ask. And of course, we were like discussing internally if uh, we like uh, if to allow the, uh, the 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 remote access for, uh, for for the audience, but then we decided because. As you can see, that the problems and if the people are not educated enough, that they can um, they can maybe even uh, permanently damage the equipment. So we uh, at the end we decided that uh, it will maybe be better if we just uh, show it. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Rudolf, for the uh, presentation and your kind introduction and. and allowing us to sh to see the equipment uh, i think it's crucial what uh, what, what uh, rudolf mentioned that setting up of the single photon detectors and, uh, and sources is not easy and i think this is the main maybe not the main challenge but uh, this needs uh, a little bit of time to adjust and and get the experience with, uh, with these kind of devices. And of course, there are different uh, different type of detectors. They operate with different environmental conditions and, and they also have different characteristics. And, uh, and as Rudolf mentioned, uh, present the aluminum foil to, uh, to reduce the dark count. I, I can, this is also our experience. So every time, of course, the, the patch codes that connect the QKD devices uh, uh, to the line and to the other equipment, they are not ideal. So during the room where the equipment is installed is experiencing uh, light during the day in specific time you can clearly see that on the performance of the device. So there is leakage and the dark count, dark current from this, uh, from this effect. So uh, ideal, but it only manifests itself when you work on the edge, really on the edge of the uh, equipment performance. During normal operational window, it shouldn't affect so much the device, but it needs to be analyzed in the extreme, I would say, conditions. Um, so I think uh, we can uh, we can move to the. Uh... Piotr, may I have one comment? Absolutely yes. ag agree with you. Even <coughs> using special patch cord with black color, if you put some extra foil or extra layer of black plastic, uh, dark counts go down. Yeah? So maybe the meta the metallic covers of patch cords will help. But this is <laughs> something out of the best or common telco practice. Yes, exactly. So this is really uh, 
another aspect that needs to be analyzed. So I think we can move to the uh, questions session. Uh, so please uh, feel, feel free to ask any questions. We have uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, even a little bit more for the discussion. So uh, please free to add uh, or state your opinions, questions. The floor is yours. Also, one maybe one comment. Also, there is a significant um, difference between the, the detection capabilities of the of the single photon detectors. I mean, when you know that uh, that there are half of the photons in one polarization and one one half of the other because it control it with the polarization control, the the, the detection of of for example the IDT and MPD they are really uh, significantly different. So. Yeah, I know but because it's of the principle and so on, but still. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, uh, Piotr already mentioned is our choice was the, let's say, the telco uh, world uh, detectors, so mean avalanche detectors, and different vendors provide different cooling. Yeah, so the MPD it's based on Peltier cooling, which has some limitations. Even it's uh, like a triple triple stage uh, Peltier cooler and uh, but IDQ um, devices let's say advance in that uh, style that uh, should allow go to minus 90 so yeah it, this is the obvious that there will be different uh, performance and the I think the best of the best uh, devices available are golden nanowire detectors which uh, need helium cooling for operation but i'm afraid that uh, uh, their performance is uh, amazing but uh, this is still kind of problem for telco world to use the helium compressor and uh, let's say helium for the cooling of the telco, uh, I, telco equipment I, I, yeah. Exactly, the superconducting detectors um, are not are actually not very uh, not very handy in the operational environment. It's totally out of the questions in the real world applications. So, for example, the detector which is uh, in the in the scenario between Cheshen and Ostrava, the detector is located uh, at uh, Ostrava site. And it's operating, uh, it's cooled by Peltier model and it's working more or less minus 40 degrees. So the system, the system needs a little bit of time to cool down, usually uh, 20, 30 minutes to achieve stable uh, thermal conditions. And then the actual key exchange and alignment of the system starts. So uh, as, as, as Josef mentioned, the system also, the QQD system, apart from the quantum channel that will uh, exchange the, the, the photons, send the photons, it, it requires also synchronization channel. Uh, so it is, uh, this channel can be sent over standard, uh, standard network as a WBM channel, for example. But it's essential to uh, to have it because it synchronizes and aligns two QQD devices at each end, and is used also for the um, uh, for the protocol initiation. And just after a few steps at the beginning, uh, the system needs to usually the system after it is being cooled down, it needs to align align the frames which are transmitted in the proper QQD protocol use, for example, the 84 uh, And in the next step, it needs to uh, minimize the quantum bit error rate and maximize the visibility. So, um, so the number of detected uh, photons. And it needs to be constantly adjusted. So uh, if you look at the system, it's constantly changing the parameters to achieve the, the lowest Huber and the highest visibility uh, for the system. That's the uh, stable operation. And these, actually these parameters are constantly monitored. And for example, they, they, they are displayed in the OpenQTD virtual testbed for each of the use case and each for, for each of the links. Yeah. 
so please free uh, to comment or add any, any other questions. Uh, we still have the time. If you have some. It's Mauro Campanella speaking. Um, Hello, Mark. Pleased to meet you. Thanks a lot for this quite interesting of the challenge. <laughs> it's been really challenging. Um, my question is your vision for what's next. Uh, I, I was really surprised by the quality of what you can get uh, in a short amount of time about these technologies because they are very, very delicate, as you clearly showed. What is your opinion? What are your plans? after this testing you have done? What is your feeling, if you want? Uh, so, for example, maybe I will start with PSNC and maybe, Joseph, Rudo, we can, uh, we can uh, next follow your, your approach. Mm -hmm. So for us, the, uh, at the moment, the main, the main task is to implement the use cases. So we have the, uh, the QTD equipment. It is connected with the uh with the encryptor infrastructure but the main challenge that we need to do and then present in the open QTD project is uh, actual use cases that use this uh this technology so specific uh applications and scenarios that we prepared in our network i will show this in my presentation later today um, but to be honest, Mauro, the, the main challenge at the moment is, uh, I, I think, standardization also, because it's starting to, uh, to slow down a little bit the progress, because uh, a lot of elements are not, I would say, agreed and are still under standardization and actually certification discussion. For example, we still do not have uh, any 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 documents that show how the systems QPD system can be certified. So so how can they be used in real conditions? So because as you know, uh, encryption and this kind of secure infrastructure needs to have uh, certificates, that, and it's only the way. This is the primary way that uh, the proof that it can be used in the operational environment. So it's not there yet, and. There is no, for example, we don't have the complete list of the attacks that the system need to be uh, uh, capable to resist and, uh, and immune to those attacks. Um, and, and of course, there is also a heavy, heavy, heavy interest in SDN approach for QDD. So uh, the system that would allow us to establish quantum key distribution model. But for now, I think, uh, so for us, for PCNC, the main approach here right now is to implement and show the real use case and the real scenarios and show the capabilities of how the system can be integrated with real infrastructure, existing infrastructure. This is the crucial thing because if we uh, do not have the possibility to integrate the system uh, with existing elements and infrastructure, it will be uh, extreme disadvantage. And so the protocols and all the elements that are connected with the standardization are very important here. And of course, uh, of course, what Professor Xereb would also discuss here uh, later today, the QCI activities and actual under QCI, there will be a heavy, heavy uh, focus to establish the test beds, national test beds and networks that will support the development of QTD technology. But also they will try to interconnect the, uh, the systems and also to um, facilitate and help to advance the, the new vendors because right now the, the technology is limited. Uh, so I think the uh, the main challenge, uh, one of the main challenges right now is uh, is the standardization, and agree agreeing on some elements that are based for further discussion and further development. 
Yeah, um, so I'm not uh, sure, Josef, if you wish to add something regarding the... Yeah, yeah I think we didn't uh, state it uh, really clearly, but uh, in uh, because uh, we have at our national project, we introduced briefly very, some very clear use case. It's uh, use cases of uh, establishing of uh, a secret channel or a safe channel on the line to the National Security Bureau, yeah, because this is one of that... Uh, relatively easy uh, use cases, uh, but uh, I'm really agree on that part regarding the standardization. On other hand, uh, on technological level, we are obviously still looking for some better solutions, which I hope we will see in twin field uh, here or in the solutions uh, coming from I think the uh, Vienna IQQA group using some polarization entanglement and the Charlie in the middle producing the key bits for the, both uh, Alice and Bob. And uh, well, Rudolf, please, what, what did I forget? I, yeah, I, I think the, the biggest challenge is uh, this in the Andrian environment is to put uh, everything uh, into the one into one fiber. Yeah, over large distances yeah. and large infrastructures so seems seems to us important, and obviously the increase of increase of reach, uh, mm -hmm. and to avoiding nodes because in present situation, Piotr, you mentioned it from Ostrava to Poznań, the uh, cost of such line using I don't know like. Uh, 10 or 12 uh, trusted nodes will be really sky high. So these are the, at least the challenges at the technological point. Yes, the, the core propagation aspect is very expensive, is very, very important. And, and uh, Mauro, I think you asked the question regarding the time and frequency references signal transmission. So uh, this is, this... Let, let, me, let me just say, yeah. We are discussing through the next iteration of the projects and all of us are interested in non-IP services. Let me call it this general way of doing things, which are trusted identity quantum. If you want, I can add also detecting earthquake in, on fibers. <laughs> this is another question. I think that your system on a tabletop is stable, but what happens if the fiber moves, for example, because of an earthquake? Probably it acts as a good detector Maybe with a lot of errors, I don't know. So the question is about what if we have a horizon to multiplex, to add or to just parallelize different services on fibers for our users? So the question is a little bit more general if you want to generalize it. What is your opinion, your experience? Yes, so this is the aspect that we are also working on, the uh, multiplexing but uh, transmission of quantum channel, which is uh, 10 times on the average, 10 times as less uh, lower power, it's, it's a challenge in respect to, uh, in respect to filtering. Uh, so we are investigating this. Uh, it is not easy, um, but certainly it is possible. And the uh, QPD system providers, for example, they they offer the systems that can be multiplexed with existing classical channels. But the drawback is the, of course, you lose a little bit of performance of the system. So you don't have the reach as, for example, for the system that is using C-band, single photon sources. So there is always the trade-off. Uh, there is a trade-off and you need, uh, so in terms, uh, for example, right now, the QPD device, the, the providers, they use 1310 nanometer wave for the system that are designed to co-propagation. Uh, so it's quite far from the usable range. So this is the only way. You could try to get it closer, but it's really a challenge of uh, extreme filtering techniques. And of course, you don't need <laughs> you you cannot have the amplifiers, of course, because you lose and destroy all the quantum states. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, this is which exactly will need more more effort. Yeah, the attenuation in 3010 is still still much 
much higher than 1550, so it uh, destroys the reach. But uh, other, otherwise, when uh, I think, I don't know exactly if Piotr or Rudolf show that paper stating uh, the um, achieved uh, distance uh, was 500 kilometers, but uh, but uh, despite 500 kilometers, it was, I think, over 60 dB. So having the budget of 60 dB in 1410 in Oband gives some quite a reasonable reach. So, but uh, yeah, <laughs> the other thing what Piotr mentioned is the amplification, the broadband noise. It's uh, still a problem, but uh, yeah, definitely we hope that uh, we have some technology advantages. This we definitely would be getting better. A few words regarding uh, some Mauro comment uh, that uh, uh, at this moment it is uh, uh, a last consultation of the Digital Europe program, whereas uh, some QCI uh, calls included. This is uh, more than 150 million of euro. And the goal is that the, on the national scale will be created some the consortia and will be built as some kind of the uh, QQD test beds connected as some the telco, academia, and the industry. And uh, it, and uh, uh, other calls, it is uh, for the certification uh, uh, issue that uh, I don't afraid that we will build a different technologies and we will not able to interoperate. Uh, uh, I think that it is the last moment where we think about this uh, uh, national consolidations and build this kind of the consortia and uh, uh, actively start in this kind of the QCI challenge. Next issue is how we are able to coordinate uh, some kind of the European actions and if, if we will able to build uh, some European infrastructure for that. And for me, it is this kind of the two goals what we should discuss during this infoshares and bring GA and others uh, bodies inside the jump. Thank you. Uh, yes, exactly. Thank you, Arthur, for, for the comment. Uh, it, it is important time because the activities will start and, and we'll try to, we need to find a way how to uh, fit in the whole system, exactly. Just one comment, uh, if I may. Yes, yes, Rudolf. To please. Arthur, I think it is really important who is the who is the the, the delegate, the Sherpa of the country. That he is building the the, the consortia uh, around him, and then he is like, uh, you know, um, positioning uh, where 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 to go with this country will go, and of course he should he should coordinate with other countries as well. So. Uh, Rudolf, I apologize because I am parallel on the two teleconferences and my, my switch. Uh, I don't know that I need uh, some comments uh, uh, here. That, uh, but uh, I think that this summary it is a kind of the policy what we should uh, create for this QCI. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Rudolf, also for the comments. So, I think. Uh, I, we can take uh, we can take five minutes break uh, just for a, for a short refreshment, and we can start with the next uh, next uh, next session and pre presentations. Uh, okay, so I think we can uh, go back to the uh, to our uh, to our next and final session uh, after short break. So uh, we will have. Um, three presentations. So I will start with the presentation regarding uh, proof of concept that uh, it is planned between OpenQPD and uh, Project and Toshiba and Jant. And then we will, as I mentioned, we will proceed to presentation of Professor Xerev and we will end conclude the session with my presentation regarding the test beds and the equipment that we have here in the Okay, you should uh, you should be able to see my 
my screen and presentation. Um, so I would like to, so it was prepared by our colleague Domenico Vincenza from Jean, but unfortunately Domenico cannot join today. So, uh, so we decided to, uh, to present this material because it, it is important and uh, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to wait. And uh, we just want to share this information with, uh, with our colleagues and community. Uh, so on behalf of Domenico, I will present this. Um, so I think we've already, um, uh, we already presented uh, this aspect that Jean is, um, Jean is trying to establish also cooperation with, uh, in case of the quantum technologies in PCI. And Jean has important role in this, uh, in this area and uh, our task, uh, which is focused on the QTD and quantum communication, prepared a um, proposal that was accepted by the Open QTD uh, in the uh, Open Call and is treated as a collaboration between the Open QTD project and CHAM. And under this uh, activity, we will perform a field trial in next, early next year using Toshiba equipment to test the long, uh, long distance, long haul QPD transmission. It's totally new approach, new system, and it, it significantly improved the distance. Uh, so Jean and, Jean and and our community as a whole, we should be important part of this to those QCI activities and certainly we need to find the right place and infrastructure to, to, to best use it and advance the technology for the, uh, for the users and the use cases. And Jean, is, uh, Jean will work closely which, uh, with partners to, to enable those use cases and establish cooperation between the, and the users and use cases. Uh, so what was already tested in Jan several years ago was uh, in the Jan network was uh, single photon uh, DB84 QPD transmission. It was tested already uh, in, in Jan network, and there was you can find an article on the OFC uh, which summarizes the um, the results. So it was the first trial and first approach uh, to test it uh, using also Toshiba systems. But now uh, what we wish to do is to test the so-called twin field solution. So apart from in, 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 in comparison to a regular approach when we have Alice and Bob and the direct transmission between Alan and Boss and Bob, uh, in twin field solution, we have an intermediate node, which is called Charlie, and we generate uh, two waves from each of the ends and align them at the central node. So we achieve in total a single photon transmission and detection for the overall system. It's an entanglement based system uh, and it has. Uh, because we use intermediate node, we actually effectively effectively double the um, the transmission range. Uh, so it is a significant improvement in the distance. Um, but of course, it's still a research and development approach. It still requires a lot of, especially advancement in packaging, uh, in order to provide a fully operational system. It's not ready yet to be fully operational system. Uh, you can find there are a lot of papers regarding twin field solution, which was developed uh, by Toshiba, and, uh, and you can also see some animation and information. And actually, the just two two months ago, when Toshiba announced the record 600, I think it was 600 kilometers transmission. It was it was using the um, uh, it was using the twin field approach uh, for the test. 
so I, as I mentioned, the, the trial is under the Open QKD project. So Toshiba develops the next generation QKD system under Open QKD project and using and um, in collaboration with Jean, we, um, we test this, uh, this system in, in real environment, in real network conditions in Jean network. Uh, Open QKD project was already discussed during our info shares. So um, I think you can find all the information on the website and, and the details also. Um, so the, the partners- You have a question, Piotr, if you want to take it from yes. Martin. Uh, yes, sure. Arthur, do you want to ask a question? Yes, exactly, Arthur, if you want to. This was probably from the previous session. Uh, if uh, not, maybe. please continue. Maybe. Apologies. Uh, so the partners, officially the partners uh, are colleagues from Cessnet, uh, Jant and Toshiba, which uh, Jant is coordinator of this uh, proof of concept. Um, and the objective is to test this long old transmission using this new, uh, new approach uh, early next year. And with the distance 20 to 150 kilometers or even more to achieve the, the best system. Of course, the, uh, it will be also multiplexed for the synchronization channels with the, uh, and the keys with the regular WDM system. Uh, so it also fits, uh, it will be discussed more by Professor Xareb, the QCI, but all these activities and the use case that we are planning uh, is also aligned with the, um, uh, the ideas and the, uh, and the activities that are planned to be under QCI ID umbrella. Uh, so, so we try to need to be an important part and, and try to find the best way, especially, especially I think as an integrator and proof of concept uh, for this kind of uh, activities. And the plan, and of course it is now it's a further discussion how to, as Arthur already mentioned and, and we discussed today, the challenge uh, I think now is to find the right uh, place and, and, and coordinate uh, because the entrants of course need to, uh, need to find the best place uh, for themselves in the aspect of national QCI activities. And maybe plan our further discussion. It's, uh, it's still hard to plan because the technology is still needs a lot of development, a lot of research. So it's hard to hard to predict, hard to predict the uh, next stage and the the actual timeline. Uh, but we can see that the quantum communication is is advancing much faster than quantum computing. It's uh, it's it, it's the first let's say step, and uh, it's advancing much faster and. Once we have the quantum repeaters uh, that are usable in the network, I think it will have a real uh, further benefit for us. Uh, so that is all for the um, for the proof of concept that we plan uh, to perform under uh, Jean uh, Jean project, and together with our colleagues, uh, we are planning this still planning this activity. And yeah, um, I think we have uh, still um, still some time for uh, for next uh, uh, for next presentation by professor. So I think we can take a, a quick just a quick uh, quick question before the next presentation. Um, if not, 
Uh, if not, uh, I think we can, uh, I, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, our, our distinguished next, uh, next, next speaker, uh, Professor Ander Xerb, which is an associate professor uh, at the head of, and head of the Department of Physics Faculty in Science and Maths and Physics uh, Ambassador in the Digital Affairs Ministry for Foreign and European Affairs Government of Malta. And Professor kindly agreed to uh, present some, some, some activities connected with PCI. Uh, so thank you, Professor, for, uh, for, for sharing this presentation with us. And uh, please feel free to start. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr. And um, as the joke goes, you know, Professor Shrif is my father, you know, I'm Andre. Um, so uh, no, thanks for the. Uh, overly kind introduction um just as a, as a as a brief run through of number of things i do in my life i i do have the department of physics at the moment at the university of malta uh, i was recently appointed a master for digital affairs by the government which um goes a lot beyond quantum and uh, into into many other many other sectors and of more perhaps relevance to the specific talk um i'm the co-chair of the europe uci board uh, on behalf of the member states and the Sherpa for the uh, for Malta on on the board. Um, as you might know, the board is mostly composed of uh, say non-technical people, but there are a couple of us who have uh, the right technical background, as well as the what we call the technical configuration, and then there's the security configuration of the board. I'm happy to discuss this in in a lot of detail uh, if anyone uh, would like more information. Um, now I had a bit of a problem with uh, kind of planning this talk because. Uh, there are many aspects that you guys know a lot more than I do, and I wasn't really sure where to, where to, where to start. So I'm going to start from the very beginning. Um, and in that way, I hope that if I say something wrong, someone will call me out. And at least, at the very least, we establish a common baseline of terminology and everything else that will help us kind of moving forward. Um, just very, very briefly, um, if we're talking about, uh, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about cryptography here. We're talking about sending information from one place to another securely. And effectively, um, distilled to its basic uh, elements. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a physicist, uh, but I like, I like simple things, as I like saying. Um, if we have two parties, Alice and Bob, who want to communicate, then they need some means of scrambling and unscrambling the information, encryption and decryption. And you know, if Alice were to send, wanted to send a message to Bob, then she would need to use that means to encrypt the message, and Bob would sort of reverse the process. Now, there are, as you as you're probably well aware, there's two kind of <laughs> major kinds of of of, of crypto cryptography of uh, of doing this. One is called symmetric, and um, here there are some advantages. One of the advantages is depending on how we um, on on the protocol that we use, depending on how we do things, um, we can make this kind of encryption completely um, impregnable. Um, so. You know, it's completely immune to attack by uh, quantum computers, by any sort of uh, computers that we can even hope to build. The problem with cryptography, which is, as its name implies, symmetric, which means that both Alice and Bob have the same mathematical object to encrypt and decrypt. The problem is, how do we get the key there? How do we get this, this object, this number, this phrase, whatever you want to call it, how do we get it to the other side? Um, there are people still going around the world in jets with uh, briefcases full of uh, USB keys and things like that. Uh, but of course, this is not a scalable solution, especially on the scale of uh, 27 uh, member states of, of the EU, for example. Uh, so, so we need to find some way to get around this. So this is what we would call the key distribution problem. One way around this is to change tactic completely and go what is, to what is called public key, public key cryptography, where now the key used to encrypt and decrypt are different but they must be mathematically related and it's this mathematical relationship that allows us to solve the key distribution problem but the price we pay is that it is now possible to reverse engineer the encryption with enough resources computational or time we can reverse engineer the encryption um, now this is this has historically not been uh, 
top of the agenda because every single time we we found uh, a way to get around some algorithms or had faster computational capacity uh, capabilities then we would simply increase the key length for example or move to a different algorithm but there are two major problems to to this to this philosophy one is quantum computers i'll say that say something more about that in a in a second um but you might think quantum computers as we just heard are still quite far from uh, from uh, from uh, being uh, usable today at least on this scale so one might say well then it's not really a problem we're dealing with the other part of the problem is that there is something which is sometimes called the store and attack or store now decrypt later attack where effectively because storage is cheap nowadays we just skim off all the encrypted data wait for computational resources to become more available and then we decrypt that information 10, 20, 30 years in the future. And some information needs to be kept secure for longer than that. So this is an attack which using our present day public key infrastructure cannot be safeguarded against. Um, as I said, the major problem that's often discussed is, is the issue with uh, upcoming quantum computers. And if we had access to a large scale quantum computers, all at least to the best of my knowledge, all public key infrastructure um, algorithms like RSA and the others are no longer secure. Okay, of course, one can discuss uh, when each key length will become less secure depending on what size of quantum computer we're going to have, but in principle, they are now attackable. And this is not something that some organizations or governments can live with. Now, it's within this framework, within this context, that uh, the EuroQCI came about. Now, the EuroQCI is, or European Quantum Communications Infrastructure, is basically a member state-led initiative. So it's not something coming from the top down from the European Commission. Uh, they facilitate our meetings, but it's a member state-led initiative. And we came together as member states um, to figure out a way around this, a technological way around this. Now, there's several benefits to doing this. Uh, of course, there's the fact that we would, if we're successful, have an ultra secure communications infrastructure. But in getting there, we would also develop the necessary technologies and increase our sovereignty and resilience with respect to technological uh, with technologies that at the moment we have to source from outside the the continent so there are there are some side benefits as well as well as the direct ones um so the declaration was signed in 2019 and since then every other member state every other eu member state rather has joined so today at the moment there is all eu member states that are also members of the euro qci and in short, basically, we, we're just promising to work together to explore how to make available across the EU an integrated quantum secure communication infrastructure um, for, you know, for technological and scientific capabilities, uh, quantum technologies and industrial competitiveness and our strategic autonomy, which is also a very, very important goal in all of this. Um, there are at least the way it's being envisaged by the member states and the commission, there's basically two segments, uh, which initially are more separate, but then they will be brought together. So there's the terrestrial segment and there's the space segment. Now, for the purposes of this audience, I would imagine the terrestrial segment is something which is of more relevance, uh, but because these segments cannot operate without each other, it's important to um, have an outlook which covers both of them. Now, from the terrestrial um, perspective, what we are envisaging is a, a federation of national quantum communications infrastructures. So starting off from national networks, eventually connecting those networks and growing the scale of the QCI until it covers the entire European Union. Um, so as I said, I mean, this will be based on national interconnected QCIs. Um, then there will be a layer of nodes which interconnect different countries together, so cross-border links, um, so cross-border nodes and links rather. Then at least one per member state, there will be um, at least one per member state um, optical ground stations. And these will be kind of the, the gateway between the terrestrial QCI and a space QCI. And, and there will also have to be some sort of um, central coordination, central um, operation facility. And this is, a lot of this is still being discussed. Um, as someone mentioned on the mailing list, on the mailing list today, um, the next Q, uh, Euro QCI board meeting is uh, in a couple of weeks time and uh, the calls are not yet out. So some of this is still being hammered out. On the space side, we are looking at both uh, low Earth orbit, um, medium and low Earth orbit, and also geostationary uh, satellites for different purposes. 
uh, depending on whether we need um, entanglement distribution, whether we're going to do prepare and measure, whether the satellite is going to be a trusted node. So there's all sorts of discussions going around there, uh, but it will very likely be a mixture of low Earth orbit CubeSats and microsatellites initially at least, and graduating onto uh, larger satellites uh, at, the, at a higher Earth orbit uh, when the technology becomes uh, becomes more available. Um, so that is basically kind of the, the space segment which will interface with the ground segment um, at, the, at the optical ground stations. Now we envisage this again, as member states, we have uh, discussed this and we envisage this to happen in two phases approximately. Um, in the first phase, it is, which is where we are at the moment, we are in the sort of proprietary and, and first deployment phase. So here we really care about developing the technological capabilities, conducting these experiments that we're talking about, um, that we just sort of heard about now, the testbed experiments, starting to build some cross-border quantum networks. We heard about the first trial um, today. Uh, there are a few others in the pipeline. Uh, so this is something which needs to be done now. We start building the ground, uh, the, the ground station infrastructure, thinking about how to organize the operations center um, and also very important testing and certification infrastructure, which is still not, uh, not, yet, uh, not yet ready for prime time. On the space side, there will be similar technological development phase um, testing and so on. So this is kind of what's being envisaged for the next few years. In a second phase, we'll start moving um, towards proper operation de deployment. So here is where we sort of build on the information and the, the, the knowledge we've, we've gathered in the first phase, and we go towards a, um, a proper functional EuroQCI network. So both terrestrially based on the technology that will be developed in Europe and, and commercialized within Europe, uh, and also from the operation operization operationalization point of view and and supporting it from the uh, um, uh, support of the support structure of the network similarly there will be development of the satellite infrastructure um, including so first generation satellites again eventually a second generation satellites and a full deployment of this around so 2026 2027 um, leading to a full interconnection between the two segments which will allow us to claim a europe-wide quantum secure communication infrastructure. Around this, there will also be um, um, activities be, uh, for, for going beyond QKD. A lot of, um, a lot of what's going on in QCI is, is really concentrated on thinking and, and, and working out problems surrounding QKD, so quantum key distribution. Whereas in general, um, one can envisage a third phase, which, uh, which would take a QCI, the QCI beyond QKD and into what we would call the quantum internet, where we can distribute quantum resources, do lots of interesting stuff like blind qu uh, cloud quantum computation and so on. But this is something that we will have to build, build up to beyond the second phase. Um, apart from what I'm about to say in a few minutes time, there's also uh, lower TRL calls um, in Horizon Europe. The European Space Agency has its own funding, which will go towards the space component of the QCI. And there is also national funds, which, as far as I'm aware, every member state has dedicated in some sense or other to building parts of this uh, parts of this infrastructure uh, in the various phases. So just as a graphical uh, overview of what we're envisaging the sort of steady state QCI to be, uh, topologically you have a number of satellites. Uh, which will each cover a certain a certain uh, geographical region uh, within the European Union. If they're lower low Earth orbit, of course, this would mean that the, the region covered by a single satellite would change uh, as the day goes on. Whereas if it's a geostationary satellite, of course, this will be a specific region uh, which will remain fixed. Now, these satellites will be connected to each other, will be able to exchange keys and so on, but they will also be connected to two or more ground stations. So the ground stations will be optical ground stations that will be able to exchange uh, quantum information, QKD, do QKD with the satellite. And the ground station would in turn be able to transfer these keys to the, the national QCI that they are connected with. And these national QCIs are then connected via cross-border links. Okay, so this is kind of the overall overarching architecture that we are perceiving. Um, on a on a sort of slightly lower level, of course, um, uh, one has to one has to also think about how the network architecture will will be put in place. So how how we will develop the software defined network software defined networking technology. How we will have all these different networks interoperating, 
not just from the hardware side, but of course also from the software side. So there's there's a lot to be done, which has to be done during this period of experimentation, shall we say, or the first phase. Now, if I may, if I if I may briefly go on to the calls of interest. Uh, so these are the calls. I'm going to highlight Digital Europe and the Connecting Europe facility because I think for this audience these are the most uh, most important ones. Now there's four calls in Digital Europe. Um, again, this Digital Europe work program has not yet been ratified. Um, we expect it to be published before the end of the month. And if it's published by the end of the month, then the calls will close around January, February, probably January. Uh, but at the moment, it still needs to be ratified. So things are liable to change. Um, not too much, but you know, there's only so much I can promise. Um, now there's two what I would call technical calls and two uh, kind of coordination calls. I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a second. So from the technical side, there's a low ETRL call, which is more about creating the industrial ecosystem. So really creating the technologies and, and pushing them closer to market. Because as I said, I mean, it is one of the headline goals to have this being a European initiative with European technology, and therefore we need to create and commercialize the technologies. Um, this also means bringing our devices out of the lab and into the telecoms infrastructure. So there needs to be a lot of work done there. And this will be a, an SME support grant, which means SMEs get 70% co-funding. Um, and and it, it's, as I said, it's meant to help create these technologies, which will in the second phase be incorporated into the, into the QCI prop end. The second call um, will be a slightly different call in that it is a call where each member state, uh, each QCI member state formally, uh, will will be expected to submit and ratify one project. The project has to be uh, signed off on by the governing authority of that specific member state. So this has to be co coordinated centrally within each member state. And, and it is effectively meant to kickstart the development of the national QCIs, which I mentioned earlier, which will eventually be interconnected. This is at a 50% co-funding rate, and we're looking at total cost of each project being around 10 to 11 million euros. So around 5 million euros per project coming from the European Commission and the rest coming from other sources, private, public, national funding, basically. Um, so this is, I say, the first big QCI or your QCI call, uh, which is meant not just to develop the technologies, but really develop the actual network itself in each member state. There will be another two calls. One, one is a coordination and support action, which uh, will coordinate all of these different activities because we're talking about 27 member states working at the same time, but independently. And in tandem, there will be another call for a certification and testing infrastructure. I can't remember the exact numbers, but we're talking about 10 or 12 million euros here. Um, so there will be a procurement grant for procuring this testing and certification infrastructure, which will be critical to to to, to making sure that the uh, that the year QCI can be certified from end to end as being as secure as it says it is. That's Digital Europe. Then there is connecting the Connecting Europe facility, and in the first phase, Connecting Europe facility is is going to have some support for linking cross border linking clearly. Um, your QCI initiative. So Digital Europe will fund the technological development and the initial deployment of national QCIs. These national QCIs will start being inter interconnected through the Connecting Europe facility too. Um, and this is envisaged in the first phase of the, of the CEF, which will be a, a work call. Um, I do not have at hand the, the, the funding magnitude, but I can source this if, if there is a question about this. So I just wanted to give a brief run through to how, how, these, will, uh, how these initiatives will be funded. Of course, bearing in mind, the lower ethereal levels will also be um, handled by Horizon Europe through the quantum flagship plus national funding. Okay, So all of this fits into one ecosystem. Um, and I think this is all I had to say. Yes, um, I hope it was a kind of um, um, informative talk. Um, and I, I, I see there's 14 messages in the chat. I hope they're not all questions for me. <laughs> um, but yes, yes. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andre, for the uh, excellent presentation. So um, just being hot from the presentation, I think we can take some questions to not lose maybe the momentum and later we can proceed to the final presentation from uh, given by myself. So 
Uh, so please free uh, to add any questions to Andrea. You can add. Yeah, can I? Right now. Because chronologically it came early. Uh, can I um, have a uh, ask Chris Deleuze, uh if 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 I understand yeah. his question correctly? Because there's this question about um, how Jean and the other partners will deal with the fifty percent co-funding. If I understand correctly, that's in yes. the year. Yes, yes that's uh, so uh, my question. Yeah. Basically, what I what I just discussed. Um, I'm not sure, kind of, what you mean by deal with it, um, but if if you mean where the money can come from, um, there is still some. The discussion is still being developed, and here I do encourage uh, specific people here to speak to their um, your QCI Sherpas so that we can, you know. We can make sure to discuss this at the at the board meeting. Uh, there is still some discussion with the commission on where the boundary lies to uh, to to what funds can be considered to be part of this fifty percent. Um, but basically, anything which can be called national funding uh, can contribute to this. There is there was a question initially whether the recovery and resilience funds can can be used, but uh, this is not. Not exactly the case. So recovery and resilience funds should not be able to be used towards this 50% co-funding, but there are some exceptions. So there we have to really look at it as a case by case basis. But we can talk about, for example, um, in-kind contributions, we can talk about equipment, we can talk about um, many other many other things. So it's quite wide, quite broad where the 50% comes from. It is, it is not limited to actual real money given by say the government or some funding agency to the consortium. It can be a lot broader than that. I'm not sure if I answered the question or if I skirted around it. <laughs> no, for me, it's uh, fine. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, I, for example, dark fibers. I, can we bring this in as a kind of in-kind contribution? Uh, my understanding is yes. Um, and in fact, this is, of course, a very, very critical comment because uh, you know these costs will add up and so on. Um, I, I, is this something which which we need to uh, get clarification on by the commission? My understanding is yes, but here I'm representing myself in saying this um, because those those were the results of my conversation so far. But we still don't have a finalized document from the commission saying what is allowed, what isn't allowed. As far as we understand, this can be classified as in kind, and in kind is acceptable. Thank you, Andre. We have a question from Stefan. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, Stefan. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, about the satellite versus fiber-based uh, deployment. Um, so, so far, I always thought the satellite-based one is for the larger distances, where the direct QKD on the fiber can't uh, get the job done. Um, now, today was the first time I actually heard about this twin field QKD, and that seems to go to 500 kilometers already uh, in some papers. Uh, so. Is there a possible future where the satellite variant is actually not needed and this would all be run over fibers instead? Um, I mean, there's always, uh, there's always a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is a future. <laughs> um, no, no, but you're joking your part, joking your part. Um, one would have to really go through the numbers. And I, I, I'm saying this very honestly, because, um, for example, with the European Space Agency, we had a conversation in Malta a couple of weeks ago, because there's still not insufficient information to see what the performance will be, given that we are so low lying and there's a lot of haze because we're in a very warm climate. So it, it is very, very difficult for me to give a very concrete answer. However, I can try by saying that, um, for certain purposes, again, let's take Malta, which is an island. Um, and let's say we want to communicate over a distance of, you know, maybe a couple of thousand kilometers uh, and bypass Italy, for example, for whatever reason. Um, then ground-based is not really going to uh, be much of an option, at least over these time, time frames, uh, where a satellite might be a more direct option for low bitrate ap applications. If we're talking about high bitrate, that could be a different story. Um, but there's still there's still issue uh, so there's still situations where even in the best case scenario I envisage a satellite um, satellite network would outperform uh, twin field or anything uh, anything like that. Uh, one would also have to have a look at the maturity and uh, whether twin field and similar mechanisms can be used, for example, beyond QKD. Uh, you know, so we know that satellites doing entanglement distribution can eventually be used to build a quantum network uh, in the true sense of the word. Can we do that using systems like Twinfield? Are we tied down to a single vendor, a single protocol? So I can't give you a proper answer because I haven't really uh, done, done all the sums. 
but my my understanding is that there will be there will be um, situations where satellite is still superior in terms of uh, connectivity or security. Plus, it's a fun project to have, you know, launching quantum satellites. So. <laughs> From the scientist's perspective, you know, I have to say that. <laughs> uh, sure. Okay. So I don't know. Trying to think. Uh, yes. I tried to go through the, uh, through the questions in the in the talk in the chat. In the meantime, though, um, yeah, yes. Mauro, if I may. Um, yes. Thanks. Um, I I have a general question. If you want. Do you think that what is done at the European level in terms of projects will satisfy the researchers' demands for a test bed and for the activities? Because it comes from my point of being an NRN and have to serve our community. And so what the European projects will provide is enough, or it is given the relatively low number of researchers in this area may fit, or do you expect and is welcome if the NRNs can provide something else or collaborate with the with researchers in this kind of a challenge, I would say. Thanks. Um, so thank you, Mara. I'm not 100% sure I understand, let's say the full, the full gist of this, but let me give you my perspective on this. Um, if, if I'm being honest, one of the things which I find most interesting working in this field in this country is I can call up our, our, our you know, telco guys and ask them to do an experiment. They'll just say yes. This doesn't seem to be the same situation. Uh, it doesn't seem to be echoed around around the continent. Um, so from the point of view of the infrastructure. I think I think the entrants are in a situation where they can help advance the state of the art much more rapidly by making the right infrastructure available and and kind of guiding the scientists uh, in, in in the right direction and seeing what parts of the infrastructure should be quantized and what what parts shouldn't. Um, I think I think beyond that though beyond that, entrants have significant experience in building. Uh, resilient, secure networks uh, for research and education, of course. But you know, if we just consider the fact that you guys build and run off and, um, uh, networks, you have significant experience in doing this. Um, whereas the QKD community in general, here I'm being very generic, does not. So there is a, a, a point at which our, our expertise does not overlap. And I think that's where there can be a lot of synergies. I'm not sure if I answered the question correctly, but I, I I feel that there is a lot to be gained from collaborating in this way. No, definitely. Thanks, thanks for the answer. The other point is that we are running our production environment of the order of 100 of gigabit or terabit. And so we need also to understand how that can be scaled, if the case, uh, to serve this kind of uh, environment. Even if you have to transfer one key per flow, then, <laughs> then we need a lot of quantum capacity anyway. So it's a challenge. Thanks a lot, but your, your answer was perfect. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Um, I don't know if there's someone else. Uh, in the meantime, if I may, there's a, there's a point by Piotr uh, in the chat about the, um, the fact that either Quantico already sells systems that can be used in an operational environment. Um, there, I agree with that specific statement, if I may, um, but one has to also keep in mind that every vendor inherently has vendor locking lock in, in the QKD, so there, there is no interoperability. There are no, to the best of my knowledge, no um, standards that allow us to kind of build on top of that and maybe have some some sort of vendor <laughs> vendor agnostic layer or even technology agnostic layer, which is which is even more of a problem. So so yes, in some sense there are bits and pieces which can be placed in a commercial uh, commercial environment, operational environment. But let's say the integration, both in terms of these bits and pieces themselves and with ordinary networks with with, with uh, telecoms networks that's still lacking and there are a few projects working in this direction mostly research projects um but from my perspective there's something which is which is lacking of course this is just my perspective Piotr, but uh... yes exactly andres so um the, the the biggest hurdle right now is exactly the standardization part so unless we have full set of guidelines um 
there is no possibility to uh, to use and and use uh, different equipment and try to exchange between different vendors. Right now, it's exactly not possible. So, as Josef mentioned, also Toshiba is uh, starting is already starting to provide systems. But uh, as you, Andre, mentioned, these are vendor locked solutions and. And uh, actually, the only way that uh, they can be used in different systems is you can use the Etsy protocol to get the keys from the equipment, but that's all, nothing more. Yeah, yeah absolutely agree right. here. We know this situation from networking uh, where we typically will have one line or one transmission system from one vendor and the uh, next from other. So the, some uh, standardized interfaces are the must which might push different yeah. things and different vendors together to to cooperate or to, to um, work together. Sorry, Piotr. In, 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 indeed, indeed. Um, can I just, can I just, uh, yeah, so Noel Ferruccio, one of my colleagues, I just answered, uh, Janos. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's work going on in Etsy, Janos. Um, there's no specific quantum standardization body, but there is work on, on the, um, being undertaken at Etsy. Uh, there's the ITUT uh, focus group on quantum technologies, which will be meeting in Berlin, I think in November. Um, and there might be a couple of others. Now, actually, if, if I may kind of go beyond my remit, uh, Piotr, and I'll get back to you, Josef, in a second. Um, if I may go slightly beyond the remit of my talk, um, there is this uh, a strong discussion amongst some standardization bodies like, like NIST in the US, uh, saying that, you know, QKD for, whatever reason, is not the preferable solution. We prefer post-quantum cryptography, what is being called post-quantum cryptography. There's two points that I think get lost in that discussion. And these two points are, for me, are absolutely critical. One is that QKD and PQC, post-quantum cryptography, are not mutually exclusive. One is a hardware protocol, the other is a software protocol. So, you know, they can work together, they can work separately, but we can't, at least it's not productive, uh, in my opinion, to discuss uh, these two solutions are somehow being <laughs> challenging each other. Uh, the other, the other is, and I think it's a subtle point, but it does often get lost in the discussion. There is no mathematical proof of any PQC algorithm which is secure against any possible quantum attack. You know, those of us who know some, and I, I emphasize some quantum computing, uh, quantum algorithms, we know that the zoo of algorithms are still quite small. Um, PQC is secure against the algorithms which are known nowadays, but that is not sufficient to be able to claim a perfect future for forward secrecy. So, uh, you know, I would temper I would temper that enthusiasm as well. Um, but you know, it's a question of getting the communities to work together and to talk to each other. Yeah. Um, so this is, yeah. this is outside the remit of my talk, Piotr. So apologies. Yeah. Yosef had. Can we uh, just to say? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say we're we're running a little bit behind time because of all the discussion. It's really interesting yeah. discussion, but I think we've still got one talk left, do we? Yeah, exactly. Uh, In which case so, we so should start that now and then whatever time we have left, we can sure. really continue the discussion, exactly. I think. That would be excellent. Uh, so Piotr, over to you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, sorry for going over time then. <laughs> no, no problem. Then. So Absolutely thank you. Fine. So, thank you. Uh, so I will uh, present quickly the, uh, the, the last, uh, last, presentation and I think we can uh, go back to the uh, to the discussion okay uh, I think you should see uh, you should see my presentation uh, so I will briefly um, present the uh, the test bits and the equipment activities that we have regarding the QPD and general quantum communication, maybe it's, uh, uh, it should be focused mainly on QPD. Um, so with a little bit of uh, introduction, so we have a number of projects, activities and uh, presentations that already are connected with not only quantum communication, but quantum computing. But particularly myself, I do uh, focus mainly on quantum key QED and quantum communication. And as PSNC, we are owner of, and, and the operator of uh, Metro 
and network in uh, Poznan. We have two data centers and we are also owner and operator of the Pioneer National Research and Education Network that connects all the colleagues from different academic uh, centers in, in, in Poznan, in Poland. And we um, together around different uh, activities and projects. So we, we are one community, one consortium. Uh, and our activities are focused on the new generation networks, HPC, grades, uh, uh, knowledge platform, future internet, and also cybersecurity. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have two data centers in Poznan, uh, the primary and backup center. We have a metro area network that is used for the number of use cases that I will refer later on and some living labs and working space. We have a number of projects, uh, especially also now from the Horizon 2020, uh, which are also connected with the uh, quantum, quantum technologies, especially National Laboratory for Photonics and Quantum Technologies, and also with the OpenQKD. Uh, we have a, also collaboration with different partners, with different companies. And as I already mentioned, our network has uh, more or less 600, 6,000 kilometers in, uh, in Poland and right now almost 10,000 kilometers of fibers in total in Europe. So uh, we try to use it for different use cases and scenarios. So, and as I mentioned, we connect uh, our co colleagues from different community, from different academic communities in Poland, so which are men mark on the map. Uh, which also have five high-performance high computing centers. Uh, the, the connectivity in Europe is mainly uh, focused for the connectivity to uh, CERN in Geneva. Uh, one connection is uh, using the fibers in Germany and the other connection is a collaboration with our colleagues from uh, from Surfnet to, to, to have the connection as a backup from using friends. And now we also receive the connection we get, uh, we, we are able to connect to, to Germany on the south side of the uh, Europe. So regarding the communication and the um, quantum communication and the quantum test that um, uh, under the uh, strategic quantum strategic research agenda for quantum uh, flagship, we've engaged in several activities connected with these uh, with these elements. And the project, as I mentioned, is open to TV, mainly a national laboratory for photonic and quantum community quantum technologies, which is a national project. Two capital, which is. Uh, which is an international project activities with Jean, Jean what we are right now uh, experiencing uh, in the work package six activities and also some small part in the IETF quantum internet research group, which is uh, a kind of research group that is trying to study some ideas for future quantum internet. That is just the research. And under open QKD, we will uh, we will establish a test bed here in Poznan. Uh, the test bed and the connection for to Ostrava is one one is one element for the, of this test bed. Um, uh, it will serve as a background for high performance computing use cases that we that we will run on our network. Uh, and we also developed, uh, we, together with the colleagues from AIT, we helped to develop uh, the virtual testbed and the way to collect the data uh, that is gathered from all the equipment, from all the QKD testbeds that can be, uh, that are already established in Europe. So the data collection that you can see and the monitoring system uh, we, we help to, to implement it and use it. Uh, also, regarding there was a question regarding uh, standardization. Just uh, last week, there was two weeks ago, apologies, there was a workshop from OpenQKD regarding the uh, standardization activities. I'm just in the process of adding all the information to OpenQKD website. So uh, just 
so in a few days, uh, I, I promise that you will have the access to all the materials from this workshop. So you will be able to see and all the documents, you will have the overview of all the standardization documents and activities right now in the area of QKD and the quantum key distribution networks. So it will be really helpful. Um, there is a roadmap for activities. It is also available on the Open QKD uh, European Commission Research, European Commission Results website. Uh, so you can you can see the uh, the progress and the ideas and the further steps in terms of the Etsy standardization. Uh, but as I mentioned, you will be able to see all the documents once they will be available. And we did establish the research, uh, the QPD infrastructure here in Poznan, and also we are in the process of establishing a long connect, long distance QPD connection between Poznan and Warsaw as, a, as an example of long distance QPD implementation. Uh, the Q Capital project is mainly focused on the uh, on the quantum communication in general. Uh, maybe I will, uh, the activities within Jand, I already explained. So we did uh, a lot, uh, part, uh, some of the demos already at the TNC 18 conference. This year at TNC 2021, we also had a live demonstration uh, together with our colleagues from, from ADVA. And, and we try to collaborate, good, contribute in terms of dissemination. Uh, uh, maybe regarding the quantum internet research group, the, there are two documents which uh, are focusing on some drafts and ideas regarding quantum internet. But these can, I highly recommend to uh, follow those documents. They give some good understanding what could be, what could be, because these documents focus on the, on the, on the functional aspect of the quantum internet, uh, not the actual physical implementation. These are two independent things, so we teach them. Uh, I will not discuss you of QCI because Andrea already mentioned. And regarding the, uh, the QKD equipment we have, um, so we have the one set of Clavis research and development QKD system that we are using in our uh, lab uh, here in Poznan for the use cases that we have uh, in the metro network. Uh, we have the uh, production ready QPD system, which is currently uh, also running on the Ostrava uh, session line that we presented earlier today. And we have also the encryptors that, of course, stay the keys and encrypt the traffic according to the room sets that we, that we design. And one element, we also have the quantum random number generator that we use for, for some other uh, internal activities. It, it's only a random number generator. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier today, uh, under OpenQPD, we will have a number of use cases connected with the uh, different services, so medical, HPC, and other critical services. So we'll try to integrate the services that we already uh, implemented in our network here in Poznan, and we will try to implement it and use it uh, together with QPD. So this is the goal. And it will be used, uh, it will be used also with the, um, uh, with the different equipment. So a part of that, we have, um, we have also quantum network simulators that we that we showed also uh, earlier this week during the info show on Wednesday. We have uh, we are some of them are already installed. We do test them in, in our infrastructure. Uh, also, we have some quantum computing simulators, which colleagues from which are more focused on the computing. They they they, they run some simulations and testing. Uh, we did the um, post quantum and QPD joint demo already at TNC 18 conference. And as I mentioned this year, we have the uh, interoperable quantum key distribution network uh, demonstration, which showed how the keys can be used between different encryptors, different QPD systems using the Etsy 
GS014 protocol. And for, for a number of use cases, we will also use Toshiba QQB equipment. So we will have both Toshiba and ID config equipment for our use cases. And these will be visible also in the virtual test method that OpenQQB project will provide. Uh, the cross-border connection uh, already, uh, yours have already discussed earlier today. Um, so uh, that's it. Um, uh, so this is our uh, testbed activities and yeah, I will be happy to take the questions if you have uh, any.